Well, it's a real pleasure to have Joe Columbus Smith with us today. Joe, a former Green Beret officer, Vietnam veteran, came to Rhodesia late 1976. And he's got a hell of a story to tell. Um, before we get into it, Joe, I just want to uh, just say a little bit about um, Americans from, from my perspective. One of the first Americans I met when I was very lucky, because I was very young, was, was the author Robert Ruark. And what an impression he made on me. Um, he was just incredibly kind and gentle, and he took the time out uh, to talk to me, and he made a massive impression. And, and um, it wasn't long after I met him, I started reading his books. And um, he's one of the reasons why I've always wanted to write, why, why I love African history. Um, he was a terrific, terrific guy. I'm sorry he died as young as he did. But um, then, you know, I went later in life, I went into the hunting game, and most of my clients were Americans. And I didn't have too many Americans who I didn't like. And I made some fantastic friends. Um, and as a result, I've come to spend a lot of time in America. And I've seen a lot of America. And I've had some of the best times of my life in that place. I've seldom been treated with anything other than terrific kindness and generosity. Um, I, I do get a little irritated when I travel abroad, particularly in Europe and, and the United Kingdom. And uh, very few people have got anything good to say about Americans. Uh, very critical. And it's always irritated me because I've ended up saying to them, you know, but you forget what the Americans did for Europe and did for the United Kingdom. Um, but they don't seem to be terribly grateful. And um, as a result, I must say, when uh, when former President, well, then President Donald Trump, um, decided, well, he, he came out and uh, he gave NATO a hard time for not spending enough money on their own defence in Europe, and I thought um, it was time an American president said and did that. Uh, they've taken a lot for granted. I think you guys have done a hell of a lot for the world. And uh, I don't know if you get the recognition and appreciation you deserve. But um, just from a... But thank from, you for that. Sorry? Well, thank you for those comments. Oh, I'm no. very grateful. Well, it, I mean it. Uh, and, and Joe, uh, thank you for coming to Indonesia all those years ago <laughs> and um, giving us a hand. But before we get, go, 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 get into that, just a little bit about um, your background, your family, and um, how you ended up in the military. Yes, my father was, a, there's a whole history of service. My grandfather, my father's side was a Texas Ranger. Uh, my father went into the Army Air Corps in 1938 uh, as a, as a pilot. He rose to the ranks very quickly and as D-Day approached, he was Lieutenant Colonel uh, at age 30 uh, on the staff of Eisenhower planning D-Day. Um, so my, on my mother's side, which is the Irish heritage side, uh, Irish American heritage side, all of her brothers, uh, th all three brothers and uh, two of the three sisters all served in the war in one capacity or another. That's the second war, of course. So deeply imbued in me as a as a tradition of, of service, and even more deeply as a tradition of the of the Cold War. Uh, my father was in a branch of uh, Strategic Air Command, and we were bounced all over. My uh, it was almost like an itinerant life. Every few years we would move to another base, where he would be in charge of some squadron, or in his final posting was in charge of a small base in Ohio. So I bounced around. I'm, I'm what you call an Air Force brat, or brat for short. <laughs> and then um, you ended up doing an officer's course and off to Vietnam. A little bit about, about that period of your life. I, uh, my father was in the Air Force, so naturally, the best traditions, I was decided, decided I was going to go in the Army. <laughs> I, uh, but I didn't take ROTC. I was on duty uh, working for a newspaper, worked for two years for the Houston Post. 
And one afternoon, I was finished deadlines, got my stories, and I walked across the street uh, to the induction center on, on Fannin Street in Houston and uh, went through the procedure of taking the test. I was went in with about 500 other guys uh, to get in. I went through basic training and I'd applied for Officer Kennedy School. I did very well on the testing going in and that helped me a great deal, helped me and hurt me, and I'll explain that later. I scored in the top percent and within 18 months of going in as a basic private, I was a Green Bray officer in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, getting ready to uh, uh, go to Vietnam. So, but to get back to the Cold War, uh, I grew up in fear of the bomb uh, and the something that is really, uh, a really uh, traumatic or uh, thing that has, thing, has molded me when I was, uh, 1957 was a great year for the Soviets. They had three great victories and the biggest one was Sputnik. It actually flew around the planet and you could look up and see it spin. When I saw that thing go around and you could hear the beep, 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 uh, it had a radio signal, I was cauterized with two things, both fear and anger, that something had to be done to stop this. And I have never changed since then. Uh, going from, Viet uh, from Vietnam to Rhodesia, it was a question of getting on patrol and basically tracking down whatever was going to spread this thing that's immediately stopped any free communication or assembly. So I was a motivated and am now a motivated Cold War guy as we see the Cold War return. Right, Joe, maybe we'll get to that a bit later, but let's go back to, let's go back to Vietnam, your, your, your time. So you, you made it into the Green Berets. So you were in the Special Forces and uh, deployed to Vietnam. Yes, um, I was, when I got off the plane and was taken to the Special Forces headquarters, I hoped that I would get into an operational unit and go straight out to a, either an A camp or get involved with something called Mobile Strike Force or else to CC, uh, CC Central, CCN, one of the out of country, uh, very top secret uh, reconnaissance units. But that's not what happened. I was stuck in, in the role of a, as a staff officer, uh, once again, for my entire each tour year. But the, I, I did see some action. I got ambushed a number of times. I was on vehicles going from point A to B. And I, was, I took journalists all over the country who wanted to see various things. Uh, at that point, the Special Forces was a very glamorous unit. So my job was to ferry and keep safe top journalists, uh, which I uh, did do. Uh, I didn't lose anyone, but I did not get the, uh, what I really wanted to do. I had a strong ambition to become a, um, uh, it was a challenge to myself that I command troops in a, in, a, in a military setting, in a war zone. So that question was left unanswered to me even when I was discharged and went back to the newspaper, newspaper business. So when I had a chance to go to Rhodesia, when I came up seven years later, I, I uh, couldn't, couldn't wait to go. How did, how did Rhodesia pop onto your radar, Joe? I had a good friend, um, a businessman who went back and forth and he went to uh, Zimbabwe to um, mine bentonite clay for the oil business. Not, he, not mine it, but collect it. It was used in drilling fluids. So he made many trips there and he was a, he was a very much a Cold War kind of a guy. And he uh, told me about it. And I was entranced by the struggle this tiny Rhodesia was, was doing, was involved in. And so you picked your bags and hit it off. Just I went off first as a freelance jour journalist, Hannes, and then I um, uh, came back a month later. Uh, I, I, I really wanted to see what it looked like there. And I was so pleased with, with what I saw that I decided I wanted to join that. It's not, of course, quite as simple as that. I was going through, there was domestic problems at home. I was going through a split. Uh, there was a lot of squabbling going on. I was saw my daughter being alienated from me and... So my uncle took me aside and said, Joe, it's probably time for you to get out of, get out of country for a while. So there were always, there's always some other factor. 
And so you went back to Salisbury and off to the recruitment offices and said, I'm here. Yes, I had an appointment. And on one, one uh, December of uh, 76, I was signed up, but not before I was reviewed by uh, an entire board of, well, I think one br brigadier and several full colonels. They asked me a number of questions. What would you do if this, if that, if this? They also um, rechecked my, recertified my DDW-214. Uh, uh, they had contacts with the Pentagon, and they got my my records to make sure that I was honorably discharged, and that I said what I said, uh, th that I was who I said I was. So there was a bit of a uh, there was a bit of a shakedown. They just didn't automatically commission me. And behind me is my, my commissioning papers uh, signed by uh, uh, President uh, 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 Rethel, uh, which I'm very proud of. And your first posting once once you were in in the army, Joe. They sent a lot of Yanks to the Welland Barracks, where there were uh, inductees, drafts going through the basic infantry course when they got out of school. And I was sent there and had the incredible good luck. Um, at that time, uh, uh, then Major Ron Morelia, Bronze Cross of Rhodesia, was in fact uh, uh, commanding one of the companies, the training companies. So I, he was my first commander, and I've never had a, a better commander. Uh, so I was just thrilled to death, and that was my introduction. I was there for six months, basically with pushing troops, uh, getting acclimated, uh, before I finagled uh, a position with the RAR, which is what I wanted. There, there was a chance of uh, troop command there, which is what I wanted since I was testing, always testing myself. And um, you took over from Godfrey Weber, who was at school with me, um, oh. who'd been who'd been killed. Yes. In a follow-up, you took over his platoon. Yes, yes, I did, and it was it's a very strange feeling to arrive someplace in the middle of the night with all these eyes looking at you, putting out that radar. You know, is this guy going to be a, a good officer? Is he going to protect us? Or so that's a very strange feeling and a sad circumstance to take over in that situation. Uh, the commander there was uh, uh, Lionel Dyke, uh, then a captain, uh, Silver Cross. So I had a second uh, very good commander, and he was my, I was one of his subbies. He was a company commander of uh, C Company, 1 RAR. I had a, the next year was very enjoyable. And Joe, uh, tell us about getting to know the Black Soldiers. Was that an easy transition? Um... Were you accepted easily or did, did it take a bit of time for them to get used to you? I think it went very, very smoothly. And it was a question, I think, of simple chemistry, vibrations bouncing back and forth. And I made a point when we would, the routine in the RIR was to go out and go oh, five to seven day patrols out of a base camp for 42 days and then come back. But when I came back, I didn't go and chat uh, so much with the, uh, other uh, subbies, I spent a lot of time in the platoon area, my platoon area, and built a relationship. And I was actually I, I, uh, with, uh, with my soldiers. So, so it was vibrations. Also, I had had a, a lot of uh, uh, contact in the, uh, as a newspaper man in Houston in the civil rights movement. I spent a lot, a lot of time with African-Americans, which of course is by no means anything like the same, but um, I, uh, I felt very comfortable around the soldiers of the, the RAR. I found them to be honest guys, straightforward. And um, specific individuals that stood out during your, in your platoon or in your company? Yes, in fact, uh, Sergeant Willie, I, uh, he, um, uh, he was my platoon sergeant uh, with my platoon and in C Company. And in fact, is a, very much a principal and a quite funny story, which I hope to tell. The, another person was um, uh, Company Sergeant Major Jonas Chitterica, who became, I think, a captain or a major in the, the new army, the Zimbabwe Defense Forces. And he was a wonderful, super intelligent Company Sergeant um, Major in B Company 1R when I was transferred there 
he and I sat down one day and uh, put together a, in a, just a couple of hours, a training syllabus. That was enjoyable. I also enjoyed uh, um, Percy Chioniki, who in the small world of Rhodesia, he was one of uh, Ron Morelia's first students uh, when the very historic uh, class school of infantry, Guello, when they had a classes for uh, African heritage officers. Joe, what, uh, what struck you about the tactical situation in Rhodesia, the way the war was being fought, um, the regimental system? How did it compare with the, with the American system? Um, the regimental system is a very special thing. I don't think we have anything like it in the USA, even in the Marine Corps, even in something like the SEALs. It, it is so deep. Uh, it goes back to the very first soldier who was in the unit, and in our case, uh, the uh, Rhodesia Native Regiment. Now I would like to go to the, the tactics that, I, uh, that were used in Rhodesia, and why I think it was so successful for so many years, and with so few people did so well. There was one universal um, uh, tactic that was used again and again with great efficiency, and, and I'd like to, if I could, explain a tactical situation. Mm -hmm. uh, my first contact uh, once being assigned, uh, uh, Lionel uh, Dyke brought some helicopters up, uh, Alouettes put me and a stick right at a certain spot where there, there, there had been a contact with, uh, I think, BSAP, uh, a PATU unit, police anti-terrorist unit. Well, uh, as soon as the helicopters left, uh, it wasn't any problem finding out where the, uh, while they were just dropping us off, there were little cups of sand blowing up and, um, making marks all around us because uh, people in a tree line, the, the CT is, uh, is, is communist terrorists, a group of probably uh, eight to 10 or eight to 12 were firing back at us, firing back at our stick of eight. Uh, so as soon as the planes lifted off, we could hear the shots and they matched the rounds. The rounds were coming really low, which meant that they had some discipline. I got everybody online. We swept, uh, right toward the tree line, right at it. There wasn't much choice. And they kept fire, kept coming. We kept firing back. We kept maintaining the line and eventually turned them around and pushed them in. And we were able to, one of our soldiers was able to hit one of the uh, CTs, but we pushed them back. They went back into the, what are called stop groups. And a stop group, for some of your audience won't know what that is. It's mainly simply a small ambush. So the principle that I use there, that we used, that the Rhodesian army used, I was what you call the hammer or the sweep line and the stop groups for the anvil. So all over, by the time I got there, it was already set in concrete in every Rhodesian soldier's mind uh, that something was gonna happen. When there was a contact, the certain group, one group was gonna become the stop group and the other group was gonna become the, the hammer. The, the RLI, uh, uh, um, Fire Force was a, on a macro scale, the one I just described. So what happened is we pushed the bad guys into the stop groups. They were very, um, uh, and it was very, very efficient that day. When I got back to camp, um, uh, Commander uh, Captain Lionel Dyke, uh, he took me to a map and uh, pointed out where he had set the stop groups, basically behind me. And he said, this, 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 and there had been a contact in every one of them. Uh, he was gifted when Lionel Dyke, uh, when he could see a map and it suddenly would blow up in front of him, the topography was there. And he said, he, he rarely ever boasted, but he said, every time a coconut, which means that when he was setting stop groups, he had an instinct, he knew where the bad guys were going to go. So the tactics, about the tactics, uh, we have, uh, I couldn't wait to get to Rhodesia, a former British colony, uh, and actually take a look at these vaunted military manuals that I've been reading about for years in history books and every place else. So when I finally opened one up, uh, I was shocked to find out that these were exactly the, uh, the books that I learned from in um, uh, the School of Infantry, the Infantry Officers Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. All the manuals there and tactics and signals and concealment they were all exactly the British field manuals, rewritten, word for word, cribbed, without any in, in mention in the Ford that these were in fact the British uh, field manuals. So I knew 
about what uh, I knew about the idea of a, a sweep group uh, and uh, uh, stop groups, ambushes. And so the tactics, in fact, there was not a big transition there. That was pretty easy. Joe, um, you and Bob McKenzie uh, did not did not cross paths. Uh, Bob, who was very prominent in, in the SAS, did you have much to do with him? No, I didn't. I've only heard good things about the man. Uh, that he, uh, I, I just didn't. I, I, I take it that you, you've met him. That you met him. Uh, I, I met him. Yeah, I didn't know him well. Uh, uh, there were, just... uh, there were a number of Yanks. I, I, uh, I kind of have always had. Whether I'm traveling, I try to, I try to kind of avoid the Yanks and learn what I can from the, the situation I'm, uh, enwrapped, enwrapped with. Joe, I want to give, with your with your permission, honest. I want to tell a, a kind of a funny story that it, we're talking completely about war, but there are many, many funny things. If I could tell a brief story that involves Sergeant Willie as yes. a platoon commander, if that's okay with you. Yes, or, it's, early, it, it, it's early morning. We're getting ready to go out on a patrol. Uh, it was the first patrol back from our ten days R and R, so we're just getting back. We're in base camp. We're getting ready to go out on a patrol. It's uh, 4.30 or 5 in the morning, we're doing the usual thing of wading through box of 762 uh, NATO rounds and ration boxes. Those are up to our ankles. And finally, one of my soldiers comes up to me and says, uh, Ishe, meaning boss, I have VD. Uh, so uh, VD it was extremely rare. But this threw a spanner in the works because we're getting ready to go. And Lionel, of course, is already all over the place. And he says uh, to somebody, go get the medic, get him up and get him here. And he brought the medic over and said, uh, medic, he said, you're going to get Lieutenant Smith here, five ampules of uh, five ampules of uh, penicillin and five syringes. And then he turned to me and said, every morning, uh, Lieutenant Smith, you're going to get up and give a shot to Private Ndufu here. And then he turned to Private, uh, I can't remember his exact name, it was something like that, uh, and said, you're to present yourself to... Uh, Lieutenant Smith every morning. So uh, every every morning uh, it was very cold. So it was a, a Rhodesian winter. I had these ampules and they were always cold. So when uh, Private Ndufu would show up, all it, when I'd wake up in the morning, I'd see this a long thigh and an outline of the buttock. And then I'd start foaming with the ampules. I'd go like this to see if I could get them warm. I'd fill the thing. And, the first shot jabbed him. For him, it was his first shots. And for me, it was the first shot ever delivered. <laughs> so that white stuff came down his thigh. And uh, this happened for about three days in a row. And I knew things were going badly. On the fourth day, I worked at a wide open space. Um, it, I, it didn't, I didn't like the wide open, never liked the wide open part. So I had everybody online. We're moving along. And on the corner of my eye, I hear a thump, a flop. And somebody goes over and uh, falls over and is muttering somewhat. Uh, but I'm exposed totally. I get people down in a, in a fine position. Where, and I send Sergeant uh, Willie, Sergeant Wilson. I said, go find out what's going on over there. And he goes over there and they, I could hear some muttering going on. And Sergeant Wilson comes back, actually laughing so hard I had to tell him. To, I said, well, what did he say? And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you, sir. You're not going to like it. Uh, I said, well, I kept badgering to tell him. And he said, well, sir, he says you're a shit doctor. <laughs> so uh, we ended up uh, taking him back, and uh, I've gotten out of the medical business. But that's the sort of funny thing that happened. The, the, no, we didn't all take him back. We, we sent a certain party, got him back to base camp, and we carried on with what was left of the operation. What had happened? He'd fallen over. He just what, collapsed. Yes, he just, uh, uh, the, the, the VD... Uh, somehow got ahead of him he didn't i didn't get it enough penicillin into him and so he just fell over and uh just had a lot of complaints about the rotten doctoring justified <laughs> so changing the the subject a bit there was always there was a lot of talk at the time and there's still talk going on about the fact that there was an intelligence gathering component in amongst the Americans um, that that came out, um, and there was a certain amount of mistrust. I don't know 
who might have been there for those reasons or or not. But um, have you got any anything to say about the intelligence gathering side of it and uh, you know possible breakdown in the in the Rhodesian intelligence system? Uh, yes, yes, I've quite quite a bit to say. I saw something that really shocked me when I was at uh, when we were when I was pushing troops with uh, uh, Ron Morelia. Oh, and the, I'm going to quick aside in the small world thing. Ron Merlia came to visit me in Texas when I was in Texas uh, back t- uh, 20 years ago, and this is his tie. Uh, he was wearing. Uh, he's a tall guy, and uh, but he liked short ties, so he had a he had a long tie, this one, and I had a short one, so we did a swap right there. That's how that, that's how small it is. But while I was under his command at. Uh, uh, Llewellyn Barracks, we had a field training exercise at, at, at uh, Essexville. There was a camp there at Essexville for training. We got out there, there were a number of Yanks there, and while we were there, a, uh, a staff car drove up, had a driver, but didn't have any any Rhodesian officers, but a man got out in civvies in a suit, and before you knew it, all the Yanks were called into a tent, and w- this fellow it turns out he was uh, Vernon Gillespie, a full colonel, still in the military, a hero in the Vietnam War, a real hero. And he was also the basis for the John Wayne part in the, uh, uh, the movie The Green Berets. Well, he got uh, about five or six of us yanks. He uh, gave us a little spiel. The spiel was this. Uh, Listen, fellas, he said, while you're here, he said, I'm, I'd like to do hometowners on you. And a hometowner, every yank, every yank knows what it is. Something is filled out, sent to your local newspaper or radio station, and they do a story about you. He said, the radio stations in the USA would love to do little stories on you. Why don't you fill this out with about your name and all of this, and I'll get a little recording of you, and we'll send those out. Well, that was a real clangor for me, because I used to put these out. I was the spokesman for all the Green Berets in Vietnam, and put out these things all the time. The worst, the, the, the real clangor was that at that time, Rhodesia was as big a pariah, an outlaw, as it is today. Uh, and so no one wanted to hear, no one was going to receive these and put, put them out. So I, the odor from the man was bad. I don't mean literally, but it was just malodorous. The, the clumsy handedness with what he was doing. I think at that point, he was trying to recruit. And uh, uh, he wanted people to... Uh, join him. Uh, it was his way of one, sending the information back to the Pentagon, I guess, to future track us, or two, maybe on the spot in a kind of reverse blackmail, get some people to sign up with him. What, uh, I've got to back up. So I did a, a just simply did a about face and walked out of the tent uh, at that point. What had happened was that he had somehow and I'm convinced, I don't have the slightest doubt in my mind that he was part of this Crippled Eagles uh, uh, plan. Uh, the Clip- Crippled Eagles was something put out by Robin Moore, again, a very famous anti-communist writer um, who also wrote the screenplay for the, um, he wrote the book called The Green Berets, and he also wrote the screenplay for the, screenplay for the movies. He started something called the, the Crippled Eagles, and it was a group uh, Americans were invited to join because when they got on r r they could go to this very lovely palace-like house on the outskirts of Salisbury and get free beer and free hot dogs. Uh, and I went one day and, and Robin Moore came out and, uh, uh, with his wife. He had a gorgeous wife who was half Russian, half Irish, had been an actress at one time. They met me and he knew who I was. I took two steps, three steps, after leaving him, he said, go get a hot dog, go get a cold beer. And five uh, photographers jumped out of nowhere and was t- taking sh- pictures of my face. Uh, uh, and that didn't feel right. They suddenly disappeared. I went over to where the beer was being served and unbelievably there was Ron Reed Daly. <laughs> so I was really quite humble. I introduced myself. I was pleased to meet him. He was surrounded by three Salute Scouts with beards and all, and I was happy to meet them. So uh, I'm putting these two things together. R- uh, Robin Moore was with the party, with the Vernon Gillespie party. Uh, he was the kind of the big figurehead. He was a very, very well-known, famous author at that time. Uh, I-, I am convinced now, without the slightest doubt, that he was sent to Rhodesia 
uh, under this thing of a Vietnam hero uh, to gain information via this uh, Crippled Eagles Association, get information about troop movements, tactics, uh, uh, numbers, uh, anything he could. He would leave once a week and go back to, uh, I think, the Rosebank Hotel, that fancy hotel in, uh, 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 in, in Johannesburg sub, uh, suburb. And if he didn't, don't, don't know who he met there, but I'll bet it was either Mugabe himself or one of Mugabe's aides handing over information. He was such a well-known man and so popular that I, I don't doubt that that information that went not back to Langley, where the CIA headquarters is, but I, I think it went straight to Mugabe. So I, I don't doubt uh, in the slightest that there was uh, horrible treason going on there and that that was a, a very bad thing. I wrote a story in great detail in I think the 2008 Soldier Fortune. The only one to ever complain about it was, uh, no one's ever questioned a word in it, was Robin Moore's wife, his third or fourth wife, a South African. And she was upset that uh, she thought it was made, made him look bad. Uh, but no one else complained. I haven't had a word of anyone gainsaying it. Before I, I wrote the article, which was years after the event, I sent uh, a letter and faxes to the CIA and said, if by any chance Bruno Gillespie is still out there, pull him in because I'm about to blow his cover. Because uh, that was years later. I'm convinced they were. I, I, I also have sympathy for General Walls for not, let's say, pulling the trigger on this operation that would have suddenly deployed uh, troops to go to attack the assembly points. Because by then he had to have known that any signal he would put out by any means, there would be so many spies from MI6 and who knows from the CIA that would immediately signal uh, the activities so that the people, the, the terrorists at the assembly points would be made aware. Uh, so, he, so as to sending out a signal, he couldn't do it. I think we were, we were, we were totally compromised there. And it's a horrible thing of a pro-Western nation in the middle of a Cold War betraying a real ally. I still get choked up thinking about it. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, Joe. I think uh, in the world of counterintelligence, we were just, uh, we were outclassed. Um, we didn't have that level of cunning um, and experience, I suppose. And uh, sometimes I actually think it's, Amazing, we so we lasted as long as we did. When you look at how thoroughly compromised the forces were at just about every level and in every service, I think so too. But I have to say this about Rhodesia: it's amazing. The regular forces were only five thousand. What I learned is that by constant patrolling in the tribal trust lands that we did, which was the main mission of the RAR when I was there, that kept the enemy. Uh, on the bounce. I mean, they kept them on the bounce for a decade and longer. Uh, this is an amazing thing. If you had told me that just so few people, uh, when you said surprising, it lasted as long as long we lasted as long as we did. Uh, I, I think that I learned something so valuable there that just constant patrolling when there aren't a lot of contacts, uh, contacts is a, a very prophylactic thing. As, and I thought the Rhodesian military, I thought they were extremely proficient. I was always very well led. And not long ago, I had a chance to tell uh, General Schutt, who was a former commander of RAR, uh, how grateful I was for, to him for the good leadership I had, which included, of course, Lionel Dyke, and also Charlie Pierce and Gavin Rostron. And they were all incredibly pro uh, professional. Uh, so we had good leadership, and I think that the the officer class, from what I saw, was every bit the um, the equal of uh, the officer class I saw in the USA. And there was a a, a really nice uh, um, nice thing about that. Everyone knew that the war was somehow coming to an end, and that things would be different. And whatever future you had in the military, that efficiency reports, none of that would matter. So people had a chance to concentrate on serious soldiering. Um, in the US Army, every officer, they can't just max their officer efficiency report. They have to get a super splendid this or that. So, so, they're, so they're so busy kissing ass all the time. Who knows what they miss uh, in, the, in the troop bay. So, so that, was, that was refreshing. Going back uh, to Vietnam, we heard Lots of stories about uh, American troops 
misbehaving in the field. Uh, there was the My Lai massacre uh, story. Um, I'm sure most American troops behave themselves, but it does sound like uh, there was lax discipline in, in many cases. Um, how, from that point of view, how did the Rhodesian soldiers uh, conduct themselves compared to the Americans in the field? Oh, very well, very well indeed. Uh, we were aware that we must never um, uh, not to alienate the local population. Uh, I'm very impressed. Uh, but I'd like to revisit uh, Vietnam. Uh, uh, Kerry, uh, uh, John Kerry, who's in the new administration, uh, uh, it went before in 1972 a congressional hearing, a Senate congressional uh, committee, and made all these allegations about the U.S. troops that every last one of them was raping and pillaging. I mean, me and every other soldier there, all the Americans. It was a blanket condemnation. And that is a, a horrific mis, uh, misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Most patrols were extremely disciplined. And I, uh, I know that I was in an elite unit. I didn't hear of any of this stuff or, or about drugs either. Uh, it, it it happened. Now let's get. I want to get back to the Cali Cali thing. He was a couple of uh, classes ahead of me at Officer Candidate School. He was a uh, Cali was the I can't remember his first name right now, but he was a fellow involved in that massacre, uh, the the My Lai massacre. William, he was a William He was a very marginal. I I when the story broke, I was going through the navigation, land navigation committee, and a guy there said he, he tried to teach uh, Cali land navigation, but he couldn't. So he was commissioned, but he was commissioned as a military policeman, not a infantryman because he didn't know land navigation, very marginal kind of guy. Uh, that massacre, I think there were 300 people killed and it was horrible. But just uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Burns came out with a Vietnam movie. And in that movie, uh, the North Vietnamese admitted that they had a massacre involving 2,600 people that happened just after the Tet Offensive. Uh, a Viet Cong killed 2,600 people, a very shallow grave was found. So their massacre, anything they did wrong, uh, would never be covered by the mm -hmm. world press. Mm -hmm. the press. The press covering Vietnam at that time was exactly precisely the CNN, the press that we have today. Yeah. And Vietnam was the most, the thing that I've still got a, a burn about that. Uh, everyone portrays it as such a horrible tragedy and that all the soldiers were victims too. Well, I don't see it that way at all. There was a little country called uh, Republic of South Vietnam. They were free, they had freedom of speech and another country came to help them. Uh, the other country, the North, North, the enemy, the North Vietnam, they were bringing in hundreds of thousands of troops because uh, the Viet Cong that they had sent in, the equivalent of our VC, uh, was unable to turn the people. They never had more than 30% of the people. So by force, coming through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the uh, North Vietnam, uh, totally in cahoots with China and Russia, who was running the anti-aircraft thing, they were trying to swamp this little country, this free country of Vietnam of 12 million people. Uh, Yet the same press, the so-called noble press that condemned uh, our effort to try to save that little country, they thought it would be just wonderful for that country for the lights to be turned out as they were in April of 75, uh, just suddenly to never be heard from again, which happens in communist country. Uh, that's why you don't hear that same crowd uh, say very much about China, uh, excuse me, Hong Kong and this very cold warish thing that happened there. The press has been clamped down the leaders of the protests have all disappeared. So I'm, uh, I've never understood the thing about Vietnam, how the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS, and the entire world press said that the US Army are trying to save this free country were the bad guys and the North Vietnam, and the, and, and North Vietnam was the good guy. Uh, General Giuk, who was of course the winner of the battle at the Anh Phu, in an interview in 1968 said that he had already spent four and a half thousand, uh, excuse me, 400,000 uh, troops lost them, more than that by 68. Of course, going and trying to invade 
uh, invade through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, so there's a, something that's very, very wrong with the press that takes the side mm -hmm. of the side that would de deny them of any freedom mm -hmm. of press. Now, uh, sometime, Hannes, this may not, Hannes, this may not be the time, but I would love to know. Uh, I've never understood this riddle of why they would love to see something happen to a little country that would destroy them of their press and assembly and all freedom. That is today a mystery and a sore point with me. Well, it's a very sore point with me too, actually, Joe. Uh, and it's a, it's something that continues to this day. Um, and when you look at what's happened in Africa since in the post-colonial period, it's a pretty sad story, almost without exception. And um, a lot of it is to do with very selective reporting by the media, the same people that provided only one side of the Vietnam story, we're only providing one side of the African story. And uh, as you know, we, we, the white minority, were portrayed across the globe as white supremacists and racists. And the fact that, you know, the world believed that all we were trying to do was protect a privileged way of life at the expense of an impoverished majority, which was a big fat lie, but it, but it worked. To see, um, the press decided to pull the blanket from South Africa, which involved, of course, Sharpstown massacres, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Beto flying off the top of a building, and this type of thing. The, the, Rhodesia was tarnished with that. But the U.S. politicians used Rhodesia so cynically, it never meant anything to any American voter who knows nothing about Africa. Uh, then uh, how do we gain enough votes for our party to get in the next time? So to the U.S. liberal voter um, or to an average voter or to the African-American voter, how can Africa be used uh, to yeah. in presidential elections to get votes? That's all it meant to them. I'm convinced. It was a hell of a shame that Carter won that election in 76. Um, his electoral victory was a, was a watershed moment in, in our history, really. Uh, we were really up against it once um, Carter became president. Um, we weren't going to get cut any slack. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, sadly, that is is what happened. I had heard rumors that had Reagan gotten in actually a little sooner, that he was that he did have an interest in Rhodesia, that he yes. was interested. And so were people like William Buckley, uh, the, the famous journalist. He was very interested in Rhodesia as well. Uh, but there were scant others. I took, when I, one of my, the, the Rhodesian government gave me a month off to return to the USA to visit my, um, uh, visit my daughter. Uh, but the, um, uh, I went to, to Washington, D.C. and walked the halls to see if I could get any sympathy. What my, I walked up and down, listen, I, I, I mentioned I wanted to talk, I've just come from Rhodesia, I was a soldier, I am a soldier there, I want to talk about it and let you know that there is, it is an entire Cold War chapter and all you're getting is one side. Well, there was only one person who would talk to me, there's a very brilliant African-American woman, a representative from New York City by the name of um, uh, Shirley Chisholm. She spent 20 minutes, would listen to me for 20 minutes and uh, said, well, thank you very much. No one else would talk to me. It was an open and shut. I think we only had a few friends in the, uh, in the um, House of Representatives and probably one mm. friend in the Senate. Mm. Well, Joe, very um, thank, you, thank you for your service and uh, thank you for your time today. It's been very, very interesting. And I know a lot of people will enjoy listening to to your story and uh, hearing it from a from an American, um, because you do speak for a bunch of people who did try very hard to help us, and uh, I know it's it's very deeply appreciated. So thanks again for what you try to do, and thanks for talking to me today. Well, thank you very much, Hannes, for for giving me a ch a chance. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thanks, John.